Welcome to the latest Staff Tech video. Coming to you, well, for at least this beginning part, from inside my living room because it's bloody freezing cold outside. This video is a mix of. <coughs> Shush. <laughs> this video is a mix of tech and testing, and it's about something we've got on all our cars, which is the air intake system. What I mean by the air intake system is on a naturally aspirated engine I mean all the way up to the throttle body and on a turbo engine I mean anything up to the turbo inlet so basically the turbo inlet pipe, the MAF sensor if there is one, the air box and the inlet snorkel to the air box. Most people go for modified air intakes because a tuning company tells them to do so or somebody on the internet tells them to do so. On the flip side of that there's loads of people who will swear blind any modified air intake is worse on power than standard, will suck in hot air, will lose your power, loads of stuff like that and in some cases that might be true as well but the fact is almost none of them have ever got any proof either. Sometimes what they call proof is just flawed science because they will reference some rolling road figures where the car with a, um, a cone filter has lost power but that's not taken into account that it's a car static on a rolling road where there's no airflow under the bonnet or very little moving airflow so it is sucking in hot air. What's my opinion on modified air intakes? Well the most important thing by far and this is what a lot of people don't take into account is enough air is far more important than cold air. You can have the coldest air in the world, but if there isn't enough of it, you're losing out more than if there was enough hot air. Having a restricted air inlet just to get cooler air is like cutting off your foot just to stop stubbing your toe. You're preventing one thing by causing a bigger problem. People go for colder air but accidentally restricting their inlet setup is actually extra stupid on turbo cars, as not only are you losing power by simply not getting enough air, no matter how cool your outside air is, once it exits the compressor housing, the temps are well over 100 degrees Celsius anyhow. So it needs a good intercooler to get it to a sensible temperature no matter what. The second and most important reason any inlet restriction is a really stupid idea on a turbo car is any restriction at all causes the turbo to work harder, which means the compressor outlet temperatures are far higher. It also means the exhaust gas temperatures are far higher. And it also means the exhaust back pressure is far higher because the turbine has to work harder. What that basically means is that no matter how cool the air is that your air filter is seeing, once it exits the compressor, it is far hotter than it would be if there wasn't a restrictive inlet set. Your actual overall temperature is much worse and your power level is far worse. So you've basically shot yourself in the foot just so you can say you're sucking in cold air. It's stupid. Having said all this, providing there's no inlet restriction, cold air is a bonus of course. And also what is a bonus is not having to modify your inlet system because it turns out it's perfectly fine after all. The thing is, most people have no proof. They don't even know how to check or they just believe what anyone tells them to. But this is Staff Tech, which is all about facts and proof rather than opinion and sales talk. So I'm going to A, show you exactly how to check if you've got any kind of inlet restriction and B, test it myself to see what's going on in one of my own cars. I've a fair few test results over the years and I don't know how independent or accurate they are but the results are always relatively similar. You tend to see a 5-10% to 10 increase in power for every 1% reduction of inlet restriction. That's the equivalent of an extra 10-20 to 20 horsepower on a 200 brake engine. Away from these tests, the actual scientific theory seems to say that for every one PSI of inlet restriction you can reduce. You should gain around about 6% power. That's fairly in the ballpark for the 5-10% to 10 increase that people have seen in the tests. And that's the equivalent of adding 12 horsepower to a turbo brake engine, which again is a fair bit for doing very little to be honest. Firstly for the power gains, the testing I've seen and even the theory seems to say if you even had one PSI of vacuum in your inlet system, you'd be mad not to sort it out. But below about mm, 0.25 PSI of vacuum, I think you're kind of got to be pretty obsessed with gaining every last horsepower to really worry about it. That's such a low level. 
One thing you don't do is use a normal vacuum gauge because when we're talking inlet restriction, unless your car intake is really properly rubbish, we're talking fractions of one PSI, not enough that would show up accurately on any normal vacuum gauge. While there's various scientific equipment you can use to test um, pressure differentials like this, the easiest way is using one of these digital manometers. They're, um, they're pretty cheap to buy, they're very easy to use, I'm a bit of an idiot with anything electronic and I can figure this out dead easy. And it's actually accurate down to 0.002 of a PSI and considering 0.25 PSI is probably about as low as you would want to even worry about adjusting your inlet for, then you don't need any more accuracy than this. Basically it's got two inputs and it basically measures the pressure differential between those two points. So you could hook up them to any two points really and check the difference, but on an intake, because you're really only worried about lower than atmospheric, the easiest way is to leave this one just to atmosphere so it knows what the ideal inlet pressure is and hook this one up to post say somewhere before your turbo or before your throttle but after your MAF sensor, your airbox and so on then it will basically show the differential in pressure at the outside air which is perfect and all the potential restrictions and then you can work out the problems from there. Obviously to test it you got to drive the car and you need to drive it all the way through the rev range with the highest numbers coming there or thereabouts at peak power. You can tend to see where peak power RPM is on a car because the numbers on the gauge will also peak and then start dropping off after that. While you're seeing the restriction at lower RPM is also kind of useful, it's, it's really the only the peak number you really need to worry about because any improvement there is also a much bigger improvement lower down. I'm going to do this test on not exactly the most exciting car in the world and it's going to be a bog standard Skoda Fabia with a, the 1.9 TDI PD100 engine the same as found in countless Volkswagens, Audis, Seats, Skodas and my reasoning for this is threefold. First up, this test is totally universal, it doesn't matter if you've got a moped or a McLaren P1, inlet restriction is inlet restriction and one PSI say of restriction is still 5 to 10 percent loss in power it doesn't matter secondly to be honest these 1.9 TDI engines are one of the most common engines in the country anyway probably in Europe so any results I see will be completely relevant to literally hundreds and thousands of cars thirdly this test was actually inspired by reading about modified Skoda Fabia VRS owners which is the 1.9 TDI engine but the slightly more powerful PD130 model saying that the intake is incredibly restrictive and they all fit the PD160 um, intake snorkel from the say Ibiza models. As far as I could see there was no actual testing or proof but their logic was sound because it was the same basic engine but the PD130s have this smaller intake, the more powerful PD160s have this larger intake so it stands to reason Say I didn't do that for fun. My question is though, how much of a restriction is it? And is it a restriction at even lower levels to that? I mean, uh, the PD160 engine, it might be a restriction if you went smaller. But I've got a PD100, 60 horsepower less. Is it a restriction or is it not at all? I want to find out. So enough talking from in the comfort of my own warm living room, let's go outside in the freezing cold and do some actual testing. Right, well this is a bog standard 1.9 TDI PD100 engine in the Fabia. And you can see here where I've mounted the feed for the digital manometer. It's after the inlet snorkel, after the airbox, after the math, and about as far back as I can realistically go and able to make any changes. You'll also see over there a boost gauge and the digital manometer. I've got the boost gauge fitted because while I'm 99% sure 
there won't be any change in peak boost because the only way there really is with an inlet restriction is if the inlet restriction is that bad that the turbo can't reach full flow and I'm pretty certain it won't be the case on this engine but I want to check anyway. I'm not going to film the testing because it's not even fun to do and certainly isn't fun to watch. It's literally going through the complete rev range all the way to the rev limiter in various gears so at various speeds and just keep doing that over and over again probably a good 10 times until I get a pretty repeatable result. Right so that's it for now and off I go. Well there we go that's the first bit of testing done and it says there's a maximum of between 1.05 and 1.15 psi vacuum in the inlet which is to be fair a pretty massive restriction way bigger than I thought it'd be for what a standard car with only 100 horsepower so if we can get that down to a more sensible level sort of well like I said earlier on sort of ideally less than a quarter of a psi we should really see a big difference before I start ripping things apart, I'm going to get the race logic timing gear and fit that because we need a baseline performance figure before we do any final testing to see what improvements we've made there because it's all well and good having less vacuum which is in theory better but let's find out for sure in that way as well. I am going to film the performance testing which I'm just going to do in third gear from 30 to 70 miles an hour which is basically from about 2000 RPM until pretty much the rev limit um, it's still not going to be massively exciting but I will show you anyway to be honest it's getting dark soon because it's winter and it's still, it's pretty, it starts getting dark by like 3 o'clock so probably by the time you see this next bit of video it will be the next day countless goes last night the best result could get which was repeatable was 10.7 seconds 30 to 70 miles an hour and third which isn't very fast but it's not a very fast car the car felt okay doing so but it certainly was running at a perfect high rpm before it hit 70 which is to be expected really on an engine like this it's much harder actually timing slower cars because the slightest hill or the slightest mistake and it really makes a big effect on times because there's just not enough power so it ruins it so because of that it took me quite a long time to get repeatable results but I got quite a lot of results in the high 10s and low 11s and then this 10.7 at best which was only very slightly off most of the other results so I'd say that's about right the thing is though will any of these intake modifications make any difference in performance let's go find out Right, the obvious place to start on this is this intake snorkel, which supposedly is the big restriction on these engines. And they're dead easy to remove. Literally, one screw there and it pulls out. It doesn't look that small or restrictive, to be perfectly honest. But they say it is, so let's find out. Well, the people on the internet were right. That snorkel is properly crap. The results now are 0.45 to 0.55 PSI restriction, about half a PSI better, or half the restriction there was, just by removing that snorkel. And obviously this is on a lowly PD100 model, something like a PD130 or a tuned PD100 even, these results are going to be massively worse. Half a PSI restriction still isn't great though, probably borderline where you'd want to start trying to improve things. So let's go back and see if we can make things better. Right, well, removing the snorkel alone has gained us half a PSI less restriction, which is pretty much half of the total restriction anyway, so it's a pretty massive result just from that. But that means we've still got about half a PSI, which isn't great still, worth, worth reducing if we can. So let's have a go at that. Um, the easiest thing would be, let's just remove the air filter, see if that's a restriction, because that's a dead easy job. Two screws, and I've done it. To be fair, the air filter is pretty big, so I don't think this is going to make any difference, but let's find out. Quickly stopped in this car park to give you an update. 
and the restrictions now showing at 0.3 to 0.4 psi so a bit of a drop more than i actually thought there would be but to be honest it's not a big enough amount that you would sort of worry about too much you probably wouldn't even feel it and also we've not got an air filter anymore which is a really stupid idea so let's go on to the next test next thing i want to try is to remove the trumpet from inside the air box i'm fairly sure this won't help if anything it might make it worse i've seen some people asking if it's a restriction and people saying well it can't do any harm removing it so let's find out if they're right or wrong say it's a restriction because it's so close to the wall of the airbox but I don't believe that for a second to be honest it's easy to check and easy to remove anyway so let's find out one trumpet Right, all done. Let's do some more driving up and down, testing the net restriction. Quick update from the side of the road. Well, as I have suspected before I even did it, removing that trumpet was a bad idea. It's not actually changing much, but now restrictions gone up to 0.35 to 0.45 psi, so worse than when it was still fitted. So we know that's a bad idea, pretty much on any car to be honest. So let's go try the next step. Well, that went pretty much as I thought, worse than before. So why don't we just remove the whole lot all the way up to the MAF sensor. That will tell us exactly how much a MAF sensor is restricting things. Let's go for another boring drive. We have everything removed, literally just straight the MAF sensor with no air box, no nothing. We're down from, to about 0.3 to 0.33 PSI vacuum at worst, which is not nothing, but we ain't gonna get any better than that because that's clearly what the MAF sensor is restricting it by. You could probably remove a little bit more restriction by removing the MAF sensor mesh, but sometimes that can confuse the readings the sensor does, so I'm gonna leave that for now. To be honest, a small drop between removing the snorkel and removing this whole lot is literally 0.15 psi. It's really not worth it for the fact that all we're getting is hot air and there's literally no filtering at all. I don't think you'd feel the difference even in a quite powerful car. So in something like this especially, it's really not worth it. As we can't realistically run with no air filter at all anyway, and all this will really be doing is sucking in hot air, considering the results, I think the best thing to do is fit a larger inlet snorkel. I don't want to spend over £100 on a PD160 snorkel just for the sake of this test. So it's time for some temporary DIY ducting using some aluminium 4 inch ducting I got from the DIY store for about £10. What we need to do is refit all the original parts minus the snorkel and then fit the new duct. First job of fitting the new duct is removing this front bit of the old one. Looking at this, I'm wondering if this is more the restriction than the actual snorkel itself, because that is next into pretty tiny. It's certainly not forced cold air because there's a gap there which runs clean as the engine bay. And on this side, not only is the ducting is big on the inlet but it, the ducting faces the engine bay more than anything. And the bit to the actual car itself would be a 90 and then another 90 degree turn, which is pretty crap for airflow to say the least. Rather than you watching me mess about for half an hour adapting some aluminium tube to fit there as a new snorkel, this is gonna be a bit Blue Peter style and a job of here's one I made earlier. And here is the one I made earlier. Basically, not very pretty, but that replaces the inlet snorkel. Then it goes around there and that goes straight onto the airbox. It doesn't seal perfectly, but it seals at least as good, probably much better than the standard setup. So it's a fair test. 
For the sake of the test, I'm going to use a couple of magic cable ties to hold it all on. And a little bit of aluminium tape at the inlet duct end, which I don't know if you see there, is actually a pretty bloody good seal, so I'm happy with that. For now at least, I'm not going to enlarge the feed to the airbox because, well, let's see what difference this makes first, and we could do that in the future if need be. But in the meantime, let's go test it. And results from the ductings in, and to be fair, I'm pretty bloody surprised how good it would be. I knew it would be better, but exactly how much better is pretty amazing. I saw a best of 0.26 psi restriction which is actually better than any results beforehand even with no air filter at all and the worst I saw was 0.40 psi restriction which was only a little bit worse than with no filter no nothing the best results I actually saw at quite high speed three points on your license type speed on the motorway so I'm guessing that was a slight ram air effect that made that even better than the no air filter at all results but to be honest, the results are only slightly better than with nothing at all. So whatever ram air effect there is, it's very tiny and not enough you'd feel. It's something you'll only find by testing it with a digital manometer. It's not any true ram air effect. You're not going to see PSI on a boost gauge. It is literally a very small amount. While I wasn't really testing this, because it's kind of a, a given it would improve things lower down if it's going to improve it up top. But the... The amount of restriction lower down what was shown on the gauge was far lower than any other test by a long way to the extent that it was almost shown zero until at least the mid range whereas all the others shown a restriction almost instantly. It's fair to say after all this testing the way forward is this bigger inlet duct and the others aren't even worth considering bothering with. So let's go out there with the timing gear again and see what performance times we actually get see if there is a real world improvement. I mean, we've got th about three quarters of a PSI difference in the lack of vacuum, but does that equate to any real performance difference? It should do, but let's find out. By the time I finish hooking up all the timing gear, it's probably going to be dark, so the next time I speak to you should be tomorrow. That's the testing all completed and it's now actually day three because it keeps getting dark on me and I run out of time. The car felt faster with this new snorkel, even when I was doing the inlet restriction test it felt better but you just didn't know. But as soon as the timing gear was on it was pretty apparent from almost straight away where the times were almost consistently at least a second faster. Almost every run was low tens or high nines. And the best run after at least 10, I mean this is the same stretch of flat road and me going over and over again. It's pretty boring but I needed to try and make it as accurate as possible. The best time was actually 8.6 seconds, over 2 seconds faster than standard. And that's just by removing what is literally 0.8 psi of an inlet restriction. Which I don't actually think is very much because even on the cars with 30 horsepower more they still use the same snorkel so I would say theirs is far worse you know I've looked at the inlet on this and it's not the worst looking thing in the world so I suspect a lot of other cars suffer from problems similar to this if not far worse especially once tuned because the best time of 8.6 seconds is over 2 seconds faster than standard which is 20% faster in fact or by removing just 0.8 psi of an inlet restriction bearing in mind this is a completely bog standard PD100 engine not even the PD-130 which has got 30 horsepower more but it's got the same inlet. And on a lot of cars, tuned cars or just completely different engines altogether, they've no doubt got far worse restrictions than this holding them back. I'm pretty amazed by the results to be honest. And from now on I'm definitely going to be using this manometer to check other inlet restrictions. So after all that testing, what's the conclusion? Well first up, people's theories were true and that intake snorkel is a real significant restriction even on my car with only 100 brake so imagine what it's like on these cars with 50 or 60 brake more it must be absolutely massively horrendous as on the face of it the setup don't actually look very different to any other typical cars standard inlet setup the snorkel isn't much smaller it's a pretty normal shape the airbox and everything else is the same similar shape and size to most others and to be honest, I'm sure a lot of inlets and cars are far more restrictive than this, especially more powerful cars. 
and from now on, now I've got the equipment and it's relatively easy to do, I'm going to be testing as many as I can get my hands on. This test has kind of opened up a can of worms for me though, because now I want to know how bad this intake restriction really is when the engine produces more power. So to be honest, I want to try and get the car remapped and then once again try the standard intake and then the big one that I fitted which works so well even with standard power and then maybe if that's showing any kind of restriction at all enlarge the inlet hole to the airbox hopefully I can get all that sorted so part two of this test will come soon but in the meantime hopefully you've enjoyed this testing and this tech info and it's taught you something and also taught you how you can do it to your own car so there's no more guessing if you need an intake or if your intake's good or not you just go out there and try it yourself obviously please like and comment on this video and if you've not already subscribed please do and hope you've enjoyed it and I'll be seeing you soon. Thanks for watching and goodbye.